Oh, man, Baloo. Sometimes running this place is like working in a zoo. You gotta learn my secret to relaxation. Hey, you're a pilot! Last I checked. Are you good? <laughs> the best, kid. I'm gonna buy a plane one day. I <laughs> hope your folks are rich. I don't have any folks. Look, I only work when I have to and no more. I've been thinking of adding a navigator. Interested? You must be Baloo. When you didn't pay your loan this morning, the bank sold the deed to me. Rebecca Cunningham, business major. I've been looking for a failing company like this for some time. Uh, this is my daughter, Molly. Kick Cloud Kicker, ma'am. I'm the navigator. You gonna be my pilot? Or what? <laughs> Ooh, they make me so angry. <laughs> <laughs> Tailspin first aired May 5th, 1990 on the Disney Channel. It was later broadcast as part of the Disney Afternoon in September of 1990. It followed the adventures of Baloo, a cargo pilot for air service Hire for Hire, operating in and outside of the tropical jungle city of Cape Suzette. To fully understand the show, let's take a trip to nearly 100 years before it aired. In 1894, the Jungle Book was published by Macmillan. A collection of short stories set mostly in colonial India from the viewpoint of its India-born British author Rudyard Kipling. Three of these stories focused on the character of Mowgli, the son of a woodcutter. As a baby, Mowgli was taken by the limping, cattle-eating tiger, Shere Khan. Mowgli is found by a tree branch and raised into boyhood by wolves and watched over by Bagheera, the panther. He also had a teacher of the various laws of the jungle, named Baloo, a sleepy, lazy brown bear who lives on a diet of honey, roots and nuts. Shere Khan wants to kill Mowgli, as he is a man, but Mowgli stands up to him and, under Bagheera's guidance, takes a red flower, Bagheera's name for fire, from the human village and scares him off. Mowgli then goes to the human village, where villager Mesua recognises him as her own son, who was also stolen by Khan, and takes the boy as her own. After three months, and unimpressed by the villagers, Mowgli has Shere Khan killed in a stampede before skinning him. A jealous village hunter, Baldeo, convinces the villagers that Mowgli is an evil wizard, and a now village bard Mowgli returns to the jungle. In another adventure, Young Mowgli is kidnapped by lawless grey apes called the Bandalog and rescued by a snake called Ka. The story continued in 1895 when Macmillan published Kipling's second jungle book. Baldeo now wants to kill the devil child Mowgli. He convinces the village that the boy had turned into a wolf. The villagers hold Mowgli's parents captive. Mowgli helps Mother Mesua and his father escape before he leads the animal people into battle with the villagers. Nearly aged 17, and with his wolf mother and father now dead, Mowgli must fight the oncoming Dole, the red hunting dog of the Deccan. After defeating them, he reunites with his now widowed mother and discovers he has a new younger brother too. The books showed a young protagonist from two conflicting communities, just as India at the time was being controlled by the imperialist rule of the British Empire. In 1966, Walt Disney was adapting The Jungle Book for the big screen. In this new interpretation, Baby Mowgli is found by Panther Bagheera and is raised by wolves. Word is that villainous tiger Shere Khan wants to kill the boy. Ka the manipulative snake is also interested in Mowgli. Mowgli befriends the lazy grey bear Baloo, much to Bagheera's annoyance. He is then captured by monkeys and taken to meet their chaotic leader, King Louie, before being rescued by Baloo. Bagheera tells the bear that he must disown Mowgli and, because of Shere Khan, not adopt him as a son. Mowgli crosses paths with the villain. Baloo returns and saves Mowgli, who eventually defeats Shere Khan using fire. Mowgli is then brought towards a nearby village where he leaves the jungle behind for his own home. The 1967 film was a huge hit with some memorable sequences. Sadly, Walt Disney passed away in 1966 before its release. In 1984, 
Michael Eisner became the new CEO of Disney. He arranged for a meeting of a select group of Disney staff at his Beverly Hills home. Eisner declared that Disney would be venturing for the first time into television animation, a field in which he wanted the company to become the number one name. He then mentioned that he wanted to make a new TV show based on a candy his son had recently enjoyed. He gave a directive to develop this into a show to one particular staff member, music producer Jim Magon. Having created success at Walt Disney Records with albums and read-along books, Magon had no previous experience of TV script writing, but was eager to learn. He went from script editor on what would become Gummy Bears to becoming a regular writer specialising in development and two-part episodes across Disney TV animation. In 1988, Magon was asked to come up with a new show. Inspired by the enormous success of Roger Rabbit and the meta idea of cartoon characters existing in the real world, Magon conceived a show about unemployed cartoon characters on the Disney lot having adventures and trying to find work. The title was Bee Players. Baloo the Bear from the Jungle Book would star as himself as an actor. Baloo's accomplice would be new character, Ricky Rat, Mickey Mouse's little-known cousin. Magon presented this pitch to the studio, but alas, it was not the home run that he expected. He persisted and repitched the show many times. According to Magon, in an interview with Amber Jones, Studio Chief Jeffrey Katzenberg eventually joked to him, If you mention B players again, I'll throw you out of that window. With B players now dead, Disney TV boss Michael Webster told Magon, You better come up with an idea quickly, or it's going to be Tumbleweed City here. Magon then remembered how, when developing DuckTales, at one stage character Launchpad was a freelance air pilot with his own courier service. He then thought, what if that could be Baloo? Teaming up with producer Mark Zaslov, Magon spent three days developing the new idea. He gave it a period setting of the 1930s, when the world still seemed mysterious. The world of National Geographic. It would be comparable to the old comic strip Terry and the Pirates, which had American protagonists on adventures in China. It would also take how Indiana Jones made the pulpy 1930s serials look exciting for a modern audience. Some new characters were introduced. Kit Cloud Kicker, a Mowgli-like sidekick, although Magon didn't want him to be human. This would be an all-anthropomorphic, bipedal take on the Jungle Book world, and without the humans. Another key character was business owner Rebecca Cunningham. A Casablanca-style neutral bar location was introduced, including another Disney Jungle Book character, King Louie but now named just Louis. When presented to Eisner and Katzenberg, Tailspin was a home run. And it was then announced to be part of a new weekday syndicated block called the Disney Afternoon. Tailspin would play alongside episodes of DuckTales, Gummy Bears and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. The tone of the show was set by the four-part origin episode, Plunder and Lightning. Kit Cloud Kicker steals a mysterious box and escapes from a gang of air pirates led by the nefarious Don Connage. Kit hitchhikes a plane using his airfoil and arrives at Louis Island Bar where he bumps into overly relaxed cargo pilot Baloo. The pirates arrive as Kit hides the box and escapes the premises. Hitching a lift with Baloo in his beloved vehicle, the Sea Duck, they outrun the pirates as Kit discloses to Baloo that he is an orphan. Once in the city of Cape Suzette, Baloo offers Kit a navigator job with his air business. Kit declines the offer, anxious to get back to Louis. A bank loan collector then appears telling Baloo he is behind on his plane payments and $3,000 must be paid back by the morning. Kit then joins Baloo, who fails to complete a job, and Baloo's air service and plane are bought by new business owner Rebecca Cunningham, who brings along her young daughter Molly. The business includes Baloo's unconventional but amazingly talented engineer, Wildcat. Rebecca intends to turn the business, which she has renamed Hire for Hire, into a moneymaker and offers Baloo a job as staff pilot and Kit the job of navigator. While the pirates continue to chase Baloo and Kit, Shere Khan, owner of Khan Industries, is also after the mystery box. Baloo and Kit reclaim the box, which contains a jewel with lightning powers, which Louis confirms to be man-made. 
Kit reveals it was stolen from Shere Khan. Baloo hides the jewel in Molly's doll and goes to visit Khan, who offers Baloo $100,000 for the item. However, Rebecca and Molly are kidnapped by the pirates. Under Kit's direction, Baloo takes the sea duck to Pirate Island and, on the way, Orphan Kit discloses that he spent the last year working as a pirate. This leads to a misunderstood double cross and an epic battle above the city of Cape Suzette where Baloo and Kit finally realise their bond. Rebecca buys back the now destroyed sea duck and both Kit and Baloo remain employees of Hire for Hire. However, Baloo now dreams of buying it all back someday. Unlike Mowgli of the Jungle Book, Kit isn't the main protagonist of Tailspin. Baloo is, and appears in every episode of the show. Phil Harris, the Baloo of the Jungle Book movie, was originally enlisted to play him in Tailspin, but due to his elderly state, he was replaced by Ed Gilbert. That's pretty big talk, little britches. <laughs> that was quite an entrance, little britches. It's not clear how old Baloo is exactly, but in one flashback to his earlier years, Baloo is driving a Model T Ford from the 1900s, whilst wearing a 1910s boater hat. There's also mention of a great war with biplanes. The great war ended 20 years ago. And given the art deco design of the series, the show's setting lines up with 1938 in our real world. Events from 10 years before or after that date include Baloo breaking the sound barrier, the invention of the first practical helicopter, and television. I've got a new idea. Television! It makes Baloo roughly middle-aged. Baloo's best friend is the sea duck, whom he talks to like a pet. <laughs> Miss me, baby. After its destruction in the pilot episode, the aircraft becomes virtually indestructible. The airfoil-riding Kit Cloudkicker was voiced by Alan Roberts and later by R.J. Williams. Good old Papa Bear. Papa Bear? Well, what are you doing here? In an interview with DAF Radio, character designer Len Smith noted that Kit's design was modified to look like child actor Scotty Beckett of the Hour Gang. According to Magon, in an interview with Total Media Bridge, the intention was to make Rebecca's character like Bagheera from The Jungle Book, parental and level-headed. He also said her dynamic with Baloo is a nod to a Rebecca from another big TV show from the time. Cheers. Miss Rebecca Howe, Sam Malone. You know, Mr. Huh. Malone, we've known each other only seconds, and I'm already tired of you. <laughs> Both Rebeccas take over a business from a middle-aged joker past his prime. Books balanced, accounts accounted for, petty cash, eh, petty. Rebecca is voiced by Sally Struthers. On the unofficial Kit Cloudkicker homepage, Jim Magon has said that with Kit, Baloo is forced to learn commitment and that Kit represents every child's search for stability and emotional balance. Baloo is carefree and can't run a business. Rebecca is careful and caring, but can't fly. The trio complete each other. Rebecca's daughter, Molly, is obsessed with her hero from the wireless adventure show, Danger Woman. She is played by Jana Michaels. Wildcat, the unusual but gentle mechanic, was based on the character of Truman Sparks from 1985 film Fandango. Mr. Hex! Oh, here he is. <laughs> hey, Blue, I finally fixed that sewer pipe. You want the old one? He is voiced by Pat Fraley. Bartender Louie, Baloo's close friend and co-star in some episodes, was voiced by Jim Cummings. And I just want you to know, I really do appreciate your money. <laughs> His establishment is very reminiscent of the bar seen in the 1982 TV show Tales of the Gold Monkey, which is set in the real world of 1938. The show, a throwback to adventure serials of the 30s, features a similarly costumed hero with a similar plane, but most notably a bar run by someone called Louie, and it is dressed in monkey statues. Magon has said it was an inspiration, as he liked the feel of the genre, which Gold Monkey itself was also inspired by. 1939's Only Angels Have Wings has been noted as an inspiration for Gold Monkey. In the Jungle Book, Shere Khan was the villain, but in Tailspin, he's not as clear-cut. Although only in 16 episodes, every time he is on screen, there is great, nail-biting suspense as to whether this time he will be a villain or not. 
Khan is a ticking time bomb roulette wheel of a character, come alive through Tony Jay's perfectly velvet voice, which sounds like both himself and George Sanders, who voiced the original Jungle Book Khan. <laughs> bon appetit. Tailspin's reconfiguration of Khan as a businessman is also arguably very much in the Kipling spirit. In the book, Bodeo the Hunter told stories that Khan was possessed by the ghost of Purun Das, an old village money collector. Note that Khan wears a red flower on his lapel, a direct nod to the fire that scared him away in both the Kipling book and the film. Give me the power, a man's red flower, so I can be like you. It's delicious visual irony that he now wears it proudly. Often across the show, his animalistic tiger instincts are foreshadowed with visual metaphors. If you look closely in some episodes, Bagheera, who gave such guidance to Mowgli and Baloo, becomes a stock background character working for Khan. With its 1930s setting, the world of Cape Suzette took its visual cues not from the Norman Rockwell-esque world of Karl Barks. The show was instead moodboarded to images of Art Deco, the Machine Age, the work of architect Hugh Ferris, and many classic Hollywood films in that style. But geographically moved to a Jungle Book-like location, and of course, without humans. Although there is a retro setting, for other design work, Magon looked forward in time and not backwards. In his earlier days at Disney TV Animation, Magon had been introduced to a couple of films that would captivate him. Nausicaa and Laputa, Castle in the Sky, by the renowned Japanese animation director Hayao Miyazaki. Kit Cloudkicker, astride his airfoil, is not dissimilar to Nausicaa. Magon wanted some more traditional thieving pirate characters, but not on water. He remembered Miyazaki's Laputa, Castle in the Sky. Nowhere is the Miyazaki influence more apparent than in the design of the Iron Vulture, the flying fortress of the air pirates. They are led by the swashbuckling Don Carnage, voiced again by vocal chameleon Jim Cummings. He voiced the eccentric villain in an absurd mash of accents. Carnage is the most broadly comedic character in the show and does justice to his own musical number in episode Plunder and Lightning. I am a pilot, I am a pilot. Swarming, dashing sabers, flashing bodies, clashing bullets, clashing with a pleasure. Carnage seems to be another Kipling-like element. Despite being an original character, he is a red wolf and his description matches the doll, the red hunting dog of the Deccan, that Mowgli fights at the climax of the second Jungle Book. Carnage's bumbling accomplices are Mad Dog, voiced by Charlie Adler, and Gibber and Dump Truck, voiced by Chuck McCann. Two other sometimes recurring characters are also not from Cape Suzette. One of them is sort of an antagonist, but not really a villain. From the chilly, authoritarian nation of Thembria, the self-important Colonel Spigot played by Michael Goff, and Meek Sergeant Dunder, voiced by Garfield's Lorenzo Music. Jim Magon spent one and a half years producing Tailspin. With 65 episodes, the amount of footage created for the show was the equivalent length of all of the Disney animated feature films running from Snow White in the late 1930s to Jungle Book in the late 1960s. Disney Japan animated the most episodes, and quite impressively, with nearly as many episodes animated by Sunwoo. Other vendors included Wang, who also did great work. However, the animation by Disney France and UK is on another level. Much of it is feature film quality and very physical. Tailspin also ventured somewhat into computer graphics. Mike Peraza, who had overseen spectacular computer graphics for The Great Mouse Detective, designed the Tailspin title graphic of Baloo, based on the Popeye cartoon logo. Using the program's deluxe paint and Sculpt 3D on his Amiga home computer, he beat out a reputable digital effects company with his effort. Ironically, the final graphic was traditionally hand animated for the show. On some earlier episodes, Peraza also used an Amiga to plot the animation of flying planes, but it was laser printed onto paper, Xeroxed onto transparencies, and cell animated by a studio. None of what is seen in the finished show was fully rendered CGI. 
Chris Stone composed and conducted the music score for Tailspin. In an interview with the Scored to Death podcast, he explains that it was recorded at Sony Studios with a 70-piece orchestra and a huge budget. Two to three hours of orchestra was recorded. Synthesizers were used to score smaller, unique moments within the episodes. The music has a sense of wonder and scale, just like the show. It often feels like the meeting place of Aaron Copeland, Gustav Holtz, and James Horner circa 1990 at his most emotional. The theme song was written by the team of the Silvishers, whom Magon had worked with at Disney Records. They had also composed the Gummy Bears theme. Soul singer Jim Gilstrap sang the verseless song, and the track was produced by Robert Kraft in a catchy Latin jazz style. It's so cleverly produced and mixed that the hollers appear from different channels, giving it an immersive sound. Just listen on your headphones. There was some tie-in merchandise for Tailspin. Playmates released a respectable toy line, which included posable action figures and two play vehicles, the Sea Duck and Don Carnage's own plane. The quality was much higher than the Darkwing Duck toy line from the same year. Several Tailspin video games were released. A version for the Nintendo NES, unlike the show, has Baloo in a mini plane flying everywhere, including into haunted houses. How dreadfully uninteresting. The Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive version bears strong similarities to the game Green Dog from the same year. It has terrible collision detection, a murky colour palette, and the instruction manual notes a swinging vine for Baloo to hold on to, but it's not in the game. And why was it released nearly a year after the show ended? All that said, the stunning cover art deserves a poster release. There was also a version for the Turbo 16. Disney's TV model at the time was to make 65 episodes of a series for syndication and repeat them. Despite being a ratings hit, Tailspin only ran for the standard 65 episodes between 1990 to 1991. On Tailspin's US release of September 1990, critic Charles Solomon for the LA Times said Disney TV's cartoon division seemed dedicated to replaying the stalest moments from the films of Spielberg and George Lucas in animation. Disney trashes its own work in Tailspin. <laughs> I first saw the Tailspin logo in autumn of 1991 on the front of the short-lived and long-forgotten Disney Weekly. Today I can't even find a high-res image of that publication. The strong graphic design of the Tailspin insignia and the instantly recognisable face of Baloo perked my interest. Shortly after, when the show first played in the UK on the Disney Club, the quality was immediately apparent. From the title sequence and the cinematic sound mix, the complicated lighting and the spectacular aerial work, Tailspin felt unlike anything seen on children's television. There's much to say about the show. Yes, it is an animated children's TV series starring talking Disney animal characters, some of whom don't even wear trousers or shoes, with fantastical air contraptions. But, with adult eyes, Tailspin has a surprising sense of awe and wonder, as well as an unusually strong emotional core. There are layers of reasons for this. They have deep roots in its original source material. Kipling's books mirrored the viewpoint of a Victorian Englishman born in colonial India as led by the British Empire. They're very much about rules, the military, and guidance. A hierarchy of father figure characters tell us to respect the leaders of the world we inhabit. Yet at its heart, it has Mowgli reuniting with his human mother and learning to accept both of his dual lives. In Disney's The Jungle Book movie, while the Indian character names were retained, the colonial element was played down. It's a very 60s movie. Well, man, what a beat. Always got a bit of action, a bit of a swinging scene, all right? The characters are either about discipline and voiced by stuffy old Brits, or they are musical, chaotic and scruffy. Very funny. At a time of counterculture and anti-war movements, the film very much reflects the contrast between the love-not-fight bohemian 60s youth and the traditional values of their disapproving World War surviving fathers. The movie took an element from Kipling's second Jungle Book, a moment in which Mowgli spots a girl at the end and made it its own. The film is really about how children discover their own direction naturally. She did that on purpose. 
Obviously. But how did Tailspin blend the Jungle Book's world of British rule, leadership and generational fathers into the world of the late 1980s? Well, Tailspin removes any human characters from its jungle setting. Mowgli's conflict between being a person of the jungle and a man are rid of, and instead the show brings mankind's most unique creation to the fore. Capitalism. Higher for higher. That's higher as in up and higher as in for money. This wasn't the first time money had been central to Disney afternoon characters. But unlike, say, Scrooge McDuck, the protagonists of Tailspin go to work because they have to go to work. Shere Khan notes the show's metaphorical upgrade overtly. Business is like a jungle. You see, there are the eaters, <laughs> and there are the eatums. Self-interested, power dressing, and with a slow and calm British voice. To overread, you could argue that he channeled how Britain really wanted itself to be seen at the time. This is the British character. It's enterprising, it's responsible, it will take the initiative. Khan even has his own privatised warship. That said, Tailspin occasionally made jokes about government regulatory bodies. Remember, we're here to help you. Yeah, to help yourself to our money. The show also features the alternative to capitalism. Again, in a way very much of its time. It is socialism that says, you must conform to the national plan to the government. This is a plot by those capitalist swine in Cape Suzette. The Thambrians look like old Soviet soldiers with Stalin moustache-like tusks, and their high marshal dresses like Cuban leader Fidel Castro with the eyebrows of Brezhnev. The Thambrians are a clear knock at world communism, played for absurd laughs. In one episode, you can see a huge line of Thambrians queuing for the Storsky, not unlike what was happening in the real Soviet Union of the time, as it was coming to an end. Baloo is a masterful, respected pilot, but as anyone in business knows, merely being skilled is not enough to stay successful. He values freedom over motivation and management, with no balance to his work and life. Working's a fate worse than being broke. He has passed his physical prime, delusional, immature and irresponsible. He even sings a musical number when we first meet him to reflect this. Another callback to his character in the Jungle Book movie. I'm gone. I love to be above it all. I'm gone. Oh, he's gone. I'm gone, man. Solid gone. He inconsistently tries to buy the sea duck back from Rebecca, but seems content when mistakenly faced with death in episode Barely Alive. I got no regrets. I've done everything I ever wanted to do. For a Disney cartoon bear, he's an intriguing, fully rounded and flawed character with an air of failure. Along with his implied middle age, it gives the show an oddly life experience perspective. Baloo is his happiest, with his head in the clouds. Rebecca, by contrast, is committed to her career and raising her daughter, and is pretty successful at both. She seems to be of a similar age to Baloo. Rebecca knows how to play the game in business, but has a weakness for people of status. Sorry, we're a high class operation, and I'm expecting important people, so goodbye. You're embarrassing me. I'm sorry, Becky. I'll try harder. Although intended to have the wisdom of Bagheera from the Jungle Book, she often makes bad judgment, as foolishly as Baloo does. Plunder and Lightning hints at the parties of Baloo, Kit, Rebecca and Molly coming together in Hire for Hire as a traditional family unit, especially in a scene where Baloo sits like a father in an armchair. In a moment deleted for syndication, Rebecca sings a heartfelt song to show her love of Molly and a motherly gesture to Kit. Home is where the heart is, wherever you may be. Remember where my heart is, and you'll always have a home. Unexpectedly, the show quickly dispenses of this. Rebecca and Molly live in a plush apartment, while Baloo and Kit sleep at Hire for Hire in separate parts of town. Kit babysits Molly for money. Baloo seems more comfortable around hippo women, even though the show unfortunately plays them for cheap laughs. He seems more appreciated by DJ Sally from episode The Time Bandit, or his flying equal, Plain Jane, in episode Waders of the Wasp Treasure. 
Oh, did anybody ever tell you your eyes sparkle when you're insulting? The ending of that episode hints at their chemistry, but Kit kills it and she's never mentioned again in the series. Across a few episodes, there are several Rebecca substitutes and rivals. They are humanoid-looking animals that must have been an awakening for a whole generation of furries. None of them seem to be too impressed by Baloo. It all adds up to the feeling that Baloo doesn't know himself or who he really is, despite his age, which makes him even more intriguing. Baloo and Rebecca tiptoe around their relationship. Someone might mistake us for friends. Maybe we are a little, Baloo. Yeah, stranger things have happened, Rebecca. Becky. Wildcat feels very much a part of this mishmashed family, like both a child and an uncle at the same time. Based on the hippie pilot Truman Sparks, he plays more as innocent and gentle rather than spaced out. Through a 21st century lens, he reads more as a positive neurodivergent character. He thinks differently, but comes up with amazing work. Episode Flight of the Snow Duck is intended to be Molly's episode, centered around valuing imagination but it really puts Wildcat's unique character and perspective forward. You'll never make anything here if you don't see it here first. In an interview with VoiceOver Herald, Pat Fraley revealed that years after Tailspin was aired, he received mail from neurodiverse fans of the show, now grown up. As children, they had identified with Wildcat and were comforted by him. Wildcat gave Fraley a new perspective on his work. Louis looks messy, but he's got the healthiest work-life balance. He's perhaps the smartest character in the show. Broadly speaking, there are three types of Tailspin episode. One is a straight pulp serial adventure, like the exciting episodes A Bad Reflection on You 1 and 2, From Here to Machinery, or It Came From Beneath the Sea Duck, the latter written by Disney Duck Comics legend Don Rosa. These kind of episodes contain elements of comedy, emotion, or both. Other episodes are the type of throwback, screwball, Howard Hawks inspired comedy where the characters are fast talking and must rush around on a wacky race against time caused by some partial misunderstanding or unlikely scenario. Some of the best episodes for this that really rev up your anxiety are The Time Bandit, Your Baloo's in the Mail, Time Waits for No Bear and Val Play. Tonally, a few of the later series episodes push the cartoon physics away from Jungle Book and more to a level of Chuck Jones. <laughs> Plus, there's at least one moment of risque humour. Never seen a set of bongos before. The episode, The Incredible Shrinking Molly, looks toward the tonal direction of Darkwing Duck. With that brand of meta humour... What's television? Come on, let's go home. And a character who seems far too similar to a Darkwing adversary. I'm not mad! Of course, I'm not thrilled about you being here either. Run! Be free! Frolic in the wilderness! I said, run away! Run away! Run away! Run away! The final type of Tailspin episode, as emphasized in the origin Plunder and Lightning, is surprisingly deeply melancholic, involving painful self reflection and loss. And the show is really good with this approach. On one hand, watching as a child audience, we wanted to see light Tom and Jerry style wacky hijinks and cartoon violence with clear cut villains and heroes. Instead, Tailspin sometimes gave us something more akin to Don Bluth, with heavy, maudlin scenes in which characters cry, take responsibility and reflect on broken dreams, failure and their perceived end, or show the world in complex shades of nuance. Now experiencing middle age, I find these episodes hold a lot of emotional truth and are quite touching. It also has to be noted that patriarchy and fatherly guidance were a big part of the Kipling books and the movie. Mowgli became a father in his final story, In the Rook. Mixing in the complicated surrogate family dynamic, intentional or not, Tailspin inherits a lot of attachment issues connected to the father. Although we never see a formal adoption, there's this paternal bond between Baloo and Kit. From now on, you're with me. Thanks, Papa Bear. Kit is a navigator to Baloo, providing him with a guide for both air journeys and life. At the end of the Jungle Book movie, Baloo accepts Mowgli disappearing with the humans, but in Tailspin, Kit stays with Baloo. However, 
Any kind of true family aspect becomes much more complex and a sensitive and cruel issue that cuts through, especially in the moving episode, Stormy Weather. No! You can't tell me what to do! You're not my dad! The episode, Double or Nothing, has Kit wanting to replace a broken record of Baloo's father, a character the series never really confronts. Not my daddy's record. Ah, Baloo. That was your favourite song, too. In the comedic, inheritance-themed episode, Bluest of the Blue Bloods, it is revealed, very light-heartedly, that Blue's von Bruenwald family was murdered by servants. Father didn't have this much trouble with the 12th Baron. Ultimately, Baloo loses everything due to historical tax bills, so the events of the episode are meaningless. While it doesn't expect you to take it seriously, the episode acknowledges a disconnect between Baloo and his family. In a few episodes, we see Baloo's older heroes who literally disappear into a setting sun, with these seasoned characters describing their decidedly rather permanent exits, strongly implying death. But uh, where will you go? Out there somewhere. We'll be all right. Now I can finally fade away to somewhere nice and quiet, and I'm leaving the world in pretty good hands. Finally, they fulfill their dreams before taking a bow. One of the best episodes, The Old Man and the Sea Duck, has a memory loss affected Baloo on his own in a cavernous pit. Fortunately, he finds the guidance of a lone old flight instructor. Without giving too much away of this incredibly emotionally powerful tale, it asks us to remember those mental figures who have made a lasting, positive influence on us. Look around you, Baloo. You're free as a bird. The skies are yours. Rebecca is like Baloo, but has neglected herself and her own romantic dreams and is now balancing that fact with raising a daughter, the father of whom we also know nothing about. In the episode Her Chance to Dream, we see the career-focused single mother Rebecca fall in love with a handsome, seasoned gentleman of another time. It's seemingly too good to be true. And of course, Rebecca is last to find out that tragically, he is not what he seems. She is then forced to make a choice between this silver-haired man who represents the selfish neglect of romantic attention in her own life and her daughter, Molly. Concerningly, Rebecca doesn't even see this as an obvious or easy choice. Yet amazingly, to the viewer, it's both understandable and devastating. Molly as a character often plays as whiny and saccharine, but she is fleshed out and given dimension in episode Jolly Molly Christmas. The young daughter goes out of her way to wish her mother a return to a Christmas snowfall on the tropical Cape Suzette, allowing Rebecca to visit cherished childhood memories. Again, a beautiful episode. With wonder, emotion and awe, these transcend children's cartoons into art. Coincidentally, Libby Hinson wrote all three of these episodes, and amazingly, she was only a few years out of film school. The show often had a refreshingly nuanced view of the world. It showed that just because we don't agree with someone or what they do, doesn't mean they're a villain. Episode Stuck on You has Don Carnage unexpectedly spare Baloo's life for the sake of honour. But he's the bad guy, isn't he? And the same can be said of Shere Khan. He could at one moment despise Baloo, and then at the next, admire him. Quiet, Professor. Let a real pilot handle this. The show's most perfectly grey portrayal of morality is episode Save the Tiger. Baloo saves Shere Khan's life, and in return is told he can have anything he wants from him. It could and should have been Baloo's chance to buy his own life back. And it is. But it's all squandered. A culture clash arises between their personalities. The stereotypical brash American and the stiff Brit who wants to avoid conflict. It's excruciating to watch as Baloo digs himself a near grave while the indirect Khan can't bring himself to say what he thinks, instead hiring goons to hold Baloo at ransom. Khan's sort of a victim here, against his predatory tiger of the Jungle Book, and his final comments at the episode's ending really show how insignificant Baloo's life is to him. Now, shall we move on to more important matters? The penultimate episode, Bygones, feels like the perfect farewell for the show, in which Baloo flies with a childhood hero. Ever since I was a kid, all I ever wanted to do was fly with you. I never wanted anything else. And becomes accepted as one of his squadron on their final mission. 
Baloo fulfills his potential and lifetime ambition. Moving forward 30 years to the 2017 DuckTales reboot, a certain Don Carnage featured in a few episodes of the show, played by Hamie Camille. Tailspin then got its own tribute episode, Oddly, the decidedly 1930s world of Tailspin somehow became part of the modern-day set world of DuckTales. But anyway, in this whistle-stop episode, we meet a grown-up Kit Cloudkicker running higher for hire by himself. It turns out Della Duck was a friend of his back in flight school. Now, Kit spends his days sleeping in a hammock while the bank is chasing him. Sound familiar? Kit is a bad and negligent pilot. Baloo whose guidance is now absent, had said Kit would make a great pilot. But I can't get my license for five more years. But when you do, you'll be a regular ace. Don't let it go to your head, but I think you're going to be a great pilot someday. You're going to be a great pilot. Yeah? You really think so? I know so. Perhaps Kit is now running higher for higher out of guilt. Kit finds the guidance he needs from DuckTales' Huey. But you are great at cloud kicking, and you are great at flying. The thing you're great at is special because you're the one that's doing it. We then see a grown-up Molly living the empowered life her mother fought for her to have. The sea duck is now part of Danger Woman's death-defying sky circus. It's a beautiful reunion, so true to Tailspin and so true to the Jungle Book movie. A big arc in such a small space of time. Aside from the now banned episode Last Horizons, Tailspin largely sidesteps awkward analogies with species and race. Everyone is an exotic animal of any size, somewhat humanoid, and there are some amusing interspecies relations. See, Father, you've been a good king. Now I'm judging. A little passionate for Hida. You wouldn't marry a panther, would you? I don't know. <laughs> Come to think of it, no panther ever asked me. <laughs> Sometimes it pushes its rules on the line between humanized animals and wild or pet animals. And who exactly is allowed to not wear clothes partly or fully? Given the weight of the real world subject matter and the quality of the writing, sometimes you wonder if they could all just be human characters. But conceptually, the idea of the Jungle Book in the world of employment is pure genius and so creatively executed. As Tailspin was reaching production, Someone else was mixing anthropomorphic people with old human aviation, and in a slightly different way. Miyazaki himself released a book called Age of the Flying Boat, the early version of a nuanced story about shame and honor, starring a cursed pigheaded pilot, Porco Rosso. Magon has noted that in the later 1992 Porco Rosso film, two cliff walls, similar to those in Cape Suzette, could be seen. Maybe Miyazaki had been watching. Probably not but it's a nice dream. Tailspin created a timeless world. A few coded Star Trek references aside. Get us out of here, Scully. The, the name's Jock. No one is stupid enough to risk the wrath of Khan. There are no dated pop culture references like, say, Darkwing Duck. Wayne Newton, eat your heart out. My future's so bright, I've got to wear shades. <laughs> okay, one point off for that. Yet, of the classic Disney afternoon block, there's something about Tailspin that makes it seem to be the least celebrated show, in spite of its enormous quality. There has been no recent movie, TV series reboot or comic series as there had been for other Disney afternoon shows. With its pulp throwback Saturday matinee serial Airborne Adventures, Tailspin reminds me of an underdog Disney feature that was released towards the end of the show's run. It too had an emotional score, this time by James Horner. Deco-dressed 1930s atmosphere, swashbuckling, and a scary Brit. Tailspin actually had a jet-powered hero episode, Bullethead Baloo. And look at this newsreel comparison to episode From Here to Machinery. You could say that something was literally in the air. That said, The Jungle Book was the last hurrah for Walt Disney before his death, and Tailspin was broadcast during the peak of Disney's renaissance reinvention. More than any other Disney afternoon show, Tailspin embodies what the Disney afternoon symbolized at the time. It debuted during some big world events. A recession, the Soviet Union was unraveling, and Thatcher met her end, though not because of a red flower. On the Wizard and Bruiser podcast, 
Jim Magon had said that many American children of the era were latchkey kids. In the mid to late 80s, there was much discussion about this topic as single and two-parent families needed bigger incomes, wages were stagnating, and there were also welfare cuts. Child school times and parent employment hours did not align. Childcare was too pricey, leaving kids to look after themselves at home. It was taxing on both children and their parents. Do you ever feel guilty? Every day. Every day. The Disney Afternoon, which introduced Tailspin, provided a two-hour block of high-quality after-school viewing content. In its own unintentional way, it helped many kids coming home to an empty house through what could have been an upsetting time. Many of these children are now adults and have approached and thanked Jim Magon for his work on the Disney Afternoon and Tailspin. Many Disney Afternoon shows were about a kind of family, often with a single parent protagonist. Jim Magon would go on to co-write the Disney Afternoon's big screen finale, the ultimate father and son story, a goofy movie. However, Tailspin was truly about balancing commitment to both an adult work life and the people we love. A mix of Victorian literature, a classic Disney animated feature, a pulpy interwar adventure comic strip, old Hollywood, and what would turn out to be the massively influential future of world animation. From a fragmented family unit, missing father figures and broken dreams, to its melancholic sunsets and nostalgic screwball hijinks, Tailspin, in its own disnified way, showed its young audience the complicated, responsible, committed working life ahead of them. But it also encouraged us to always look up above the clouds for escapism and adventure.